El profesor de, que ahora va a dar la conferencia es eh, Julian Bell, que es escritor y pintor inglés de una interesantísima herencia familiar. No en vano está emparentado con Virginia Woolf. Y el profesor Julian Bell es autor de la publicación traducida al español en el 2008 por la editorial Paidos como El espejo del mundo, en la que con una enorme claridad didáctica confecciona un retrato global de relaciones entre diferentes culturas a través del tiempo y del espacio, para descifrar las claves técnicas de una lectura mundial de la historia del arte. Con el sugerente título de la conferencia de hoy, La terquedad de los objetos, desafíos de la presentación de una historia del arte universal, el profesor Bell nos planteará los retos y dificultades en los métodos de aprendizaje de la historia del arte. Su conocimiento de la materia le viene, por tanto, de su experiencia como profesor durante años de Historia y Teoría del Arte en la City and Guilds de, de, de la Escuela de Arte de Londres, sino también y primordialmente a través de su enorme intuición como artista. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, Disculpeme, no hablo mucho español. Um, I must speak in English. I, I, I'm sorry. At the beginning of this course of lectures, Professor Calvo Serrarier introduced the vision of the world's art to which André Malraux gave the inspired appellation, the imaginary museum. I want to take up the theme by discussing how that totality might be apprehended, how it might be communicated, how it relates to actual museums, indeed to the physical museum that is imaginatively hosting this conference. I'll start by restating very briefly the nature of Malraux's thoughts on art. I'll also note their controversial status. I'll then illustrate my own attempts to, to think about global art by discussing the relation between two artifacts which came from far separated parts of the world, which will involve me in discussing the history of art history. From that, I will turn to a second illustration, examining the co historical cause and effect relation between the work of two other artists who likewise inhabited different continents. And that will lead me back to the question of how, practically, we might approach the relation, relations between artifacts, art history, and actual museums. Now, when Malraux devoted himself to writing about art during the late 1940s, he transferred to a more pleasurable terrain the accents of crisis, of spiritual aspiration, and of internationalism that had characterized his involvement in mid-20th century politics. You see him here during his time in Spain. Against the desperate chiaroscuro of recent history, there needed to be a radiantly colorful vision of what humans could imagine and create. And by bringing together his aesthetic experiences from Angkor Wat to Athens, he hoped to give heart to contemporary culture, urging a post-religious age towards a new spiritual agenda. In art, Malraux claimed, Ancient was not synonymous with dead, and foreign was not synonymous with incomprehensible. Art was a category that cut across time and space in a liberating manner. Our imaginative communion with the masterpieces from all over the world kept changing dynamically and would always face into the future. Malraux wrote, Metamorphosis is not an accident, it is the very life of the work of art. That imaginative communion could only be facilitated by the age of mechanical rep reproduction, quickened by the ubiquity of photography. For the past hundred years, he wrote, the history of art has been the history of what can be photographed. For art objects were not fixed petrified deposits of meaning. They were charges of spiritual potential, forever involved in becoming something to someone. 
Malraux was, in his own way, a devoted disciple of Nietzsche. Partly for that reason, Malraux's writings were vehemently attacked for, by the most famous English language art historian of his era. Ernst Gombrich, a Viennese Jew relocated to London, was another European intellectual deeply affected by Nazism. But from it, he drew the lesson that the overarching abstract categories devised by German philosophy, be they state, race, zeitgeist, or Kunst, were in the highest degree dangerous. And thus, he began his most famous book, which is likewise a product of the late 1940s, there really is no such thing as art. There are only artists. It may seem paradoxical, then, that this book is entitled The Story of Art. But Gombrich believed he had a mission as a pedagogue to enlighten a new post-war generation as to the history and achievements of a civilization that had just been in mortal peril. And, to, and that, to that end, familiar, if imprecise, terms such as art would serve his audience as a useful point of departure on the route to finer discriminations. These finer discriminations, Gombrich believed, were utterly effaced by what he called the myth-making of Malraux. The Frenchman's writings Incantations, Gombrich described them, products of expressionist hysteria, insistently deny the importance of the intentions of the artist and the actual ascertainable conditions in which the work was produced. They fail to respect historical truth. Each of us must try to understand our fellow humans and thus the artworks they produce, but we should admit, Gombrich wrote, that we can understand some better, some worse, and some only after a lot of work. Our interpretations of art are fallible, a fact that Malraux's grandiose panoptic vision of the imaginary museum ignores. Now, having brought these two great European intellects into the arena to fight it out, let me turn instead to two very different heads. I do so in order to introduce my own dealings with global art history. You will find these two images right in the middle of my book, Mirror of the World, Espejo del Mundo, reproduced on the recto and the verso of a page in the sixth of the book's 12 chapters. I hope you may feel, as I do, that there is a certain current of imaginative electricity running between the two images. But I have to admit that there is no causal historical connection, whatever, linking this sheet of paper drawn in Renaissance Germany with that lump of stone chiseled in ancient Mexico. Or is that an exaggeration? To look at the matter scientifically, and perhaps we should look at the matter scientifically if art history is to maintain its status as an intellectual discipline, there is a connection, only it is almost unimaginably distant. I've drawn it out for you. Both these are products of a subspecies that emerged in Eastern Africa, let's call it with Adam and Eve, some 150,000 years ago, that got the habit of producing figurative images and that gradually spread by a process of diffusion, migration across the planet. One group entering the Americas from Northeastern Asia some 15,000 years ago retains the extremely ancient Paleolithic practice of shamanism, a spiritual practice that turns on the interchange between worlds and between different worldly states, between human and animal, between male and female, between death and life. The art of the shaman, here seen 
in an example from Canada's Pacific coast, expresses this power to switch between states through multiple wooden masks. In the urban cultures that grow up in Mexico from around 1000 BC, this principle becomes a philosophy given more permanent form by works in fired clay and stone, such as these images of death and life. It's this tradition that my Mexican sculpture belongs to. Images of Ometeotl, which is to say in Nahuatl, the Mexican tongue, to God, the lord of duality, the lord of the paradoxical but necessary interdependence of the states of life and death. This example was carved by a Totonac, that is, an inhabitant of a city now called Veracruz on Mexico's Gulf Coast. My sheet of paper you will recognize as the work of the young Albrecht Dürer. We're looking at the face of a brilliant 20-year-old who's currently trying to gain a foothold in the big growth industry of late 15th century Germany, printmaking. He's been trying out a design for a print of the Holy Family. He's not satisfied with the pose of the figure of Joseph, so he turns the paper over. This is the, the recto and the verso of one sheet of paper. And he turns to his Venetian mirror to work out a better relation of head and hand. So here we have an artist in the midst of two important modernizing trends of his era in Europe. We have the rise of mass-reproduced imagery with, identic with identical high-quality devotional pictures passing into thousands of private homes. And at the same time, we have the rise of self-portraiture with artists increasingly from the time of Masaccio, including their own images within their own compositions. There is Masaccio putting himself in the tribute money. Now, to set together these two images, which come from such profoundly different contexts, as illustrations to a text that runs straight from the one to the other, might seem, from Gombrich's point of view, the height of Malrussian intellectual irresponsibility. Indeed, Gombrich's diatribe seems almost explicitly to warn against my cross-cultural linkage when he urges us to recognize that our fathers and our grandfathers were not quite wrong when they thought that we understand certain styles better than others, that a Rembrandt self-portrait or a Vato painting means more to us than an Aztec idol or a Negro mask. Respect your own perspective as a product of European civilization, Gombrich argues. Respect the fact that you come from a certain somewhere and take some pride in those origins. Gombrich could, no doubt, have claimed a precedent for such an assertively local stance by turning to the father of European art history. Vasari, in the lives of the artists from 1550, naturally assumes that Italy comes first in the arts. And in, fa in fact, as a native of Tuscany, he goes further, claiming that in the practices of these disciplines, the Tuscan genius has always been preeminent, from Giotto to Michelangelo. Gombrich might have had less sympathy with his own German-speaking ancestors, uh, uh, who, who from Winkel, uh, uh, as art, in art history, who from Winkelmann onwards, to, through Hegel, Wolf, Lynn, etc., uh, projected an increasingly philosophized vision of art history that always took as its premise the centrality of ancient Greece. Yet while the story of art, Gombrich's story of art, discards the philosophic abstractions of his German predecessors, it definitely upholds that Hellenocentrism, that centrality of Greece. It makes the naturalism of the Greeks 
the foundation of a sustained, all-important relation between European artists and nature, that is to say, the world they physically perceive. I'm talking about what is, deservedly, for many reasons, the most successful art history book ever published. With its clarity and its courtesy to the reader, the story of art has served as a matchless educational aid, provided that you use some other text for the 20th century, when the disparity between what artists create and what the physical world looks like gives Gombrich major explanatory problems. With that significant adjustment, you get a good, comprehensible, teachable roadmap of art history looking something like this. This is my, my drawing of it. Um, we go from the Paleolithics of Altamira and Lascaux through Egypt to Athens to Rome, and then things get a little complicated in the Middle Ages, and some art wanders off into Islam, and then we get a, a good, firm highway starting to emerge again in the 15th century with the Renaissance, and it leads us from Florence to Rome, and then come the end of the 17th century to Paris, where the Salon happens and the isms, and then, of course, in 1939, the whole scene decamps to New York, and that's the climax of art history. That's, this, is, this is the orthodox version. Somewhere in the distance, there's, there's China somewhere, and then there's somewhere there's Japan, and somewhere else, Africa, and who knows, India. Um, but um, uh, anyway, the, this is a fine, as I say, and comprehensible roadmap. Yet, in the 60 or so years since the story of art was published, the actual conditions under which art history operates have come to look more and more like those simultaneously described by Malraux in the Imaginary Museum. Malraux's belief that art breeds principally on art rather than, as Gombrich preferred to believe, on nature, Malraux's insistence on art's internal dynamics has, for a start, largely been borne out by the history of 20th century art. And then, the identity of the Europe, or the so-called West, that Gombrich was defending has been significantly affected by the pervasive processes of global migration, which have brought together populations from different continents as never before. But chiefly, of course, the age of photographic reproduction that concerned Malraux has now been subsumed within a larger, more all-encompassing age of virtuality. For us today, a near infinity of visual references from Altamira to Anselm Kiefer, from Jamaica to Japan, are no more than a click away at almost any point in the world with the Prado, of course, leading the way in offering internet users high-definition vertical encounters with great art. The cultural past no longer presents itself as a linear highway. It has become a vast, delirious expanse. But the, the, each image that seems to punctuate that expanse invites the viewer down a separate tunnel of history, none of which connect. So how do you tell a story of art that acknowledges these new conditions? You don't. That has been the prevalent consensus for quite some time now. You might indeed compose a volume covering all the major art traditions that treats each culture, each continent, as a separate history, segregating Asian, African, and ancient American arts into chapters that do not connect to the chapters on Europe. Honor and Fleming's World History of Art, published in 1982, would be an admirable example of such an approach. But in the more recent past, the consensus has become that voiced by James Elkins in his witty and skeptical deconstruction of art historical narrative, 
Stories of Art, little book published five years ago, um, when he writes, the single story of art is simply too flawed to serve as a repository for our current sense of art history. So, that is the context in which I began work on my own project. There are two things to be said about its origins. One, that it arose because I had been teaching at a London art school, addressing students from all over the world who had come to that cosmopolitan city, and I wished to offer them a common historical framework. Two, that I thought I could perform this task because I was myself a painter and thus have some knowledge of the daily work of art. Even if I am not Michelangelo, nor a Neolithic potter, nor a Japanese printmaker, I, like them, have spent much of my working life facing a certain object in a certain room, trying to make that object look how it needs to look. I thought I could bring some empathy to my account of those artists. And, in fact, the character of my work as a painter relates to my historical project. I conceived it in the panoramic manner I conceive many of my canvases. Just as here you see some 270 degrees of the horizon stretching out from the very place where my feet are standing, In the same way, um, uh, I dreamt of constructing a broad vision of art history, explicitly acknowledging the place where I myself stand as a particular British male born in 1952. And so, I set to work as if I were a painter hanging an exhibition. I collected images from all over the world always considering, like Malraux, how compelling those images might appear when translated to the small format of book reproduction, and I lined them up, seeking out imaginative affinities. The emotional, instinctual logic of my imaginary museum came first. It dictated, for instance, that this sculpture from India line up with that sculpture from Germany, that this painting from France conjoin that painting from Iran, and, of course, the pairing of the Dürer drawing and Mexican sculpture that I began with. But there was one crucial distinction from the methodology of Malraux. One point of procedure I share with the very different project Amanda Renshaw discussed yesterday. For both of us, chronology is absolute. If art in some way transcends time, it still needs to be set against time, against the ticking of a common global clock. And so, just as the beginnings of tragic sacred imagery in Western Europe around 970 coincide with the advent of sacred eroticism in India, and just as the design values of French and of Iranian painters uh, start again to speak to one another in a strange manner after five centuries of considerable divergence around in the era of Napoleon. It's a, it's a comparison that Amanda touched on uh, in yesterday's talk. Uh, this is a Qajar painter from Tehran, uh, uh, and of course that is an early painting by Ankara. Uh, done at both at the same time, and both emphasizing the linear design qualities rather than the uh, volumetric uh, aspects of the motif. Likewise, so far as we can discover, it is around the year 1492 that the ancient Mexican carves his head of duality. And it is in that year also that Dürer draws his own face. Now, 
methodology rather than art appreciation as such is the main agenda of this course of lectures. But I think it's relevant to remark on the enormous intrinsic interest of these two images, which I chanced on through a combination of instinct and chronological method. In the 10 minutes or so that Dürer spends looking into his Venetian mirror in 1492, the record of an artist's physiognomy opens out for the first time in history to emerge as an inquiry into the interminable problems of selfhood and consciousness. The way his quill pen scratches out, who am I and is it enough that I am as I am, foretells Shakespeare's Hamlet, the work of Rembrandt, the whole tradition of philosophically inquiring portrayal down to the 20th century. It is indeed a staging post on the road of modernity. Yet equally, the ancient Mexican head is in its own context a powerfully innovative work. The unnamed sculptor has left off the traditional contrast of flesh with skull and substituted it for it a contrast of form with formlessness, an alternation effected, as you can see, by the hack of the sculptor's chisel. If one compares this to sentiments expressed in various Mexican poets, poems of the 15th century, one sees that the sculpture is indeed a self-conscious meditation on the power of the creative artist, a humble but authentic spiritual relative to the sculptures of Michelangelo. But there is, of course, a third participant in the chronological coincidence. 1492 is the year of Columbus. 27 years after he brings Europe and the Americas into a common cartography for the first time, the expedition of Cortes sets foot on the Mexican mainland. The first people Cortes meets are the Totonacs, who welcome him with open arms, for he promises to liberate them from their imperialist oppressors, the Aztecs. In fact, both cultures, as we know, are decapitated by the shock arrival of guns, germs, and Christian zeal. Much of Mexico's high art is destroyed in Autos da Fe, though some, though, is shipped back to the court of Charles V in 1520. And who is the sole visitor to that court to appreciate the aesthetic quality of the trophies from Mexico? Dürer, by now a middle-aged international celebrity. In his diary, he writes these noble words. I have seen the things brought back to the king from the new golden land. In all my life, I have seen nothing which gladdened my heart so much. For I have seen among them wonders of art and have marveled at the subtle inventiveness of men in foreign lands. <coughs> Excuse me, it's a, it's a quote I found very moving. Of the items that uh, Dürer viewed, nothing survives. Probably many pieces were goldsmith's work, melted down to pay the bills of the King of Spain. Such was the overall policy. The exploitation of the descendants of that Totonac sculptor helped pay for the patronage of Titian, Rubens, and Velasquez. And with that narrative, as I see it, we see the way that history typically operates, ironically and in despite of art. It plays bad jokes on the fine, fascinating, aesthetic sentiments of artists such as Dürer and the nameless Mexican. Well, that is to say that modern history does, at any rate. The expansion and diversification of human cultures that I showed you in that map of the world becomes, the nearer we get to the present, an implosion, the set of forcible cultural collisions 
that we term globalisation. In such a light, there is a story of art to trace, but it is not a tidy roadmap. I think it looks more like this. At one end of my drawing, we have the spread of human cultures from their Paleolithic origins. At the other, their frantic convergence in the age of the internet and global warming. You could regard this ugly drawing as a skeleton outline of the beautiful volume of mine that Adicionius Paidos have published. How, though, does such a vision of history relate to Malraux's imaginary, imaginary museum and, indeed, to the actual physical museum? To approach that question, I should like to trace another story of inter intercontinental collision. Now, one of the traditions I trace is the thousand-year record of West African metal sculpture. Starting among the Igbo in Nigeria, metal casting, sometimes of a quality unmatched anywhere in the world, becomes a fixture of court art among the town-building kingdoms along the Guinea coast of Africa. From the exquisite masterpieces of 12th century Ife and of 16th century Benin, we arrive, come the mid-19th century, at this. This figure stands the height of a man, and he represents the god Gu, or Ogun. Ogun presides over civilization, for he is the god of iron. This sculpture is made of iron. And it is through forging tools of iron that man triumphs over the bush, the wilderness, becomes a great builder and a great soldier, forging mighty kingdoms. Such is the mythic thought underlying the sculpture. These are the historical circumstances. This ghoul was made around 1860 in the kingdom of Daomey, um, a country that now, rather confusingly, is called the Republic of Benin though it's a different place from the ancient city of that name. But there it is on the map of Africa. Since the 17th century, Daomey had become a great power in the region by sending out its armies, including its famous and much feared Amazon warriors, to raid for captives all around West Africa. Captives which the Dahomeans then sold to the European slave traders. Uh, I illustrate with various European artists' visions of Dahomey. Um, there is a procession of the court. There is the king of Dahomey in some 19th century printmaker's uh, imagination. Here are its sexy Amazon warriors with their rifles in a, a, a photograph from 1900. Um, now, from the early 19th century, the trouble was that the cause of abolition increasingly damaged the slave trade, impacting on the court of Dahme and its whole economic rationale. Its monarchy, deprived of a, uh, 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 an econ economic reason, was threatened with redundancy in the 19th century world order. And it reacted, like the late Romanovs of Russia, perhaps, by retreating into an expressionistic barrage of state rituals. It was this cultural regime that the iron statue served. The artist was a Yoruba from Nigeria named Akati Ekpele Kendo, a man captured, let's just look at the statue again, a man captured by the Dahomeyan armies and requisitioned to work in the royal smithies. What Akati invented for Dahomey's King Galele was faithful to the age-old myth of Gu or Ogun, incorporating all the god's attributes on his crown. 
iron tools such as you may still see collected in contemporary shrines to the deity. This is a photo taken quite recently in West Africa of uh, a sacrifice to Ogun. But for the first time, it would seem, Akati converted the deity into a personality, a freestanding individual with his own swaggering charisma. Why did he make this innovation? Along the Guinea coast, in the place of the slave ships, the missionaries were arriving. They were bringing their devotional statues to their chapels, images of Europe's personified god. Other wooden sculptures from the court of King Glele clearly respond to that exotic influence. This is uh, an extraordinary wooden sculpture, likewise the height of a man, uh, which represents the king of Dahomey in the, um, uh, under the metaphor of a shark. Uh, and it's clearly modelled on uh, European uh, sculpting traditions. Surely the dynamic marching stance of Gu, which is unprecedented in the region tr regional tradition, uh, reflects this influence too. Well, from Europe, the missionaries arrived, and after them, the armies. France and Britain decided that colonial empires formed the logical solution to the end of the slave trade, and in 1894, the French gunned their way into what they called the barbaric kingdom of Dahomey, claiming to introduce civilization for the first time. And so it was that a certain Captain Fonsagrive brought back to Paris the regalia of the African court. You can see not only Gou, but that statue of the king as a shark just behind him there. To be, uh, he, they were displayed in the ethnographic museum of the Trocadero in Paris amidst imperial trophies whose origins ranged from Indochina to Madagascar to Tahiti. Thirteen years later, that ethnographic museum, which had become, as is so often the fate of museums, a refuge for the city's down and outs, it received a casual visit from an inquisitive young artist. Let me quote what Picasso would later have to say. When I went to the old Trocadero, it was disgusting. Like a flea market, the smell. I wanted to get away, but I didn't. I stayed. I understood that it was important that something was happening to me, right? Those Negro pieces were intercessors. They were mediators. They were against everything, against unknown, threatening spirits. I understood. I, too, am against everything. I, too, believe that everything is unknown, that everything is an enemy. Those fetishes were weapons. All alone in that awful museum with masks, dolls made by the redskins, dusty mannequins, I understood why I was a painter. Now, as everyone knows, it was chiefly the masks from Africa that made the most immediate impact on Picasso's work in the Demoiselle d'Avignon. But by 1908, the most inquisitive artist of the 20th century, with the sharpest visual memory, was trying to incorporate the impact of the dusty mannequin created 50 years before by Akati into his painting. Here you see a clear response to it in a 1908 canvas. And I would suggest that the deepest impact of the Iron Man sets in later, during the 1920s, when Akati's goo is becoming an avant-garde celebrity here is Picasso's surrealist friend, Michel Leris, sidling up to Gou. And Picasso draws on Akati's recycling bit part approach to sculptural construction 
as he develops his new sculptural idiom of drawing in space, assisted by Julio González. Arguably, therefore, Akati's innovative creation for the court of King Galele is a significant ancestor to 20th century welded sculpture, from David Smith to Anthony Caro, maybe to Shiyida. We could also talk, but we won't now, about how Picasso himself influences a whole new generation of African artists. Well, the ironies in all this sequence hardly need to be spelt out. Naturally, there is the issue of how one culture's mythic embodiment of civilization becomes another culture's epitome of barbarism. And then there is the consideration that a work of art categorized as profoundly alien turns out, on closer inspection, to be the product of a dialogue of influences. A high art tradition from African courts meets some minor exported manifestations of European sculpture and the results feed back into the mainstream of 20th century European art. And this, in turn, touches on the deeply troubled moral history that relates the, that relates the two continents in a kind of malign symbiosis. Note, too, that some of the accents of African myth the struggle against the randomness of nature, the impulse to defeat the bush, do seem to communicate themselves to Picasso when he invokes a war against everything, even if that is thoroughly an expression of his personal existential stance. What I've not spelt out, however, is that all the remarks I have attributed to Picasso issue from the pen of André Malraux, they are to be found in a memoir Malraux published in 1974, a year after the artist's death, in which he recollects conversations he had with his friend back in 1937. There's no reason, there's no reason to doubt that the substance of the account of the visit to the Trocadero stems from Picasso himself. And yet at the same time, the episode has become Holy Malrusian. The newcomer artist has divined the essence of the work of tradition, leaping across cultural boundaries to do so, and he will build on it, surpass it. The circumstances of origin of that work are deemed both unknowable and fundamentally irrelevant. As Malraux himself wrote, obeying what was the conventional wisdom of his generation, African art has no history. Moreover, the circumstances of the fateful encounter itself are a museum that is only too physical, far too vilely, imperialistically, 19th century, smelly, sordid, old. Come 1973, when Malraux is writing, we would hardly wish, go, uh, wish to go back and stand as Picasso stood in 1907 in that claustrophobic junk shop. We should face forward into a world of smooth, airy, deodorized presentations, a world of photography, of virtuality. Some of the mission statements that Thomas Krenz offered us yesterday speak for just such a Malrusian future. Imagine a museum in constant motion. The Guggenheim, he said, is not a place. Is this the direction, then, in which the museum should head? No. At just that same moment when Malraux was writing in the early 1970s, Robert Smithson, the famous creator of the spiral jetty in America, is pushing art in a new and contrary direction with his diatribes against the suave sterility of the contemporary art museum and his new projects of pilgrimage and ritual, of restoring defiantly a physicality, a singularity, even a proud, anomalous absurdity to what constitutes art. 
so much important artwork since that time has constituted an attempt to resist the all-incorporating empire of the reproducible image. And it is in that light that I should like to approach the museum in relation to projects such as my own. What I do on my studio wall, placing a photo of this sheet of paper next to a photo of that lump of stone, may, I hope, create imaginative electricity. It may also, with the crucial proviso that we observe the constraints of chronology, be made to answer to Gombrich's demand that in approaching each work of art, we respect its circumstances of production and the intentions that lay behind it. Indeed, that we take into account the moral implications that surround it. But that same conjunction of paper and stone would not, I believe, carry an aura of conviction if we were physically to juxtapose the two artworks. Nor should we expect it to. Physical museums should stand in outright contrast to imaginary museums such as my own. No, I do not ask that once again, like Picasso's Trocadero, they alienate us with their smell. But they should by all means confront us with the peculiar, surprising, sometimes frightening, sometimes disarming physicality of objects often brutally wrenched from the circumstances of their origins. They should insist upon the awkwardness of artefacts. Thank you. <laughs>